morning. It is my great joy to be with you again this morning. In just a few minutes, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. So please, if you have a Bible, take a copy of it and turn to Luke chapter 14. Um, if you don't have a Bible in a chair near you, as we always say, underneath one, there is a Bible. And we'll be on page 873 in the chair Bibles, which, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, feel free to take the chair Bible. Uh, we want you to have a copy of the Bible. While you're turning there, I want to ask for your prayers this morning. The theme of this text today is humility and pride. Um, humility is one of those things that is very easy to get wrong. Um, pride can easily creep up in our lives in ways that we don't expect or don't see. And sometimes even when we try to be humble, we fail. Um, and pride is dangerous. I think we all know that. It's so dangerous, in fact, that the 19th century bishop, J.C. Ryle, once wrote, quote, Nothing is so likely to keep a man out of heaven and prevent him seeing Christ as pride. So pray for me this morning that I can faithfully communicate God's word and pray for us that we can hear what the Lord wants to teach us. So with that in mind, will you please stand now as we read the word of God. Luke 14, 1 through 14. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before them who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. And he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and be, you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Let's pray. Father God, we need your help this morning. Not so much to understand the passage, but to apply it. I pray, Holy Spirit, you will convict us as we, as we hear what you have to teach us this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, main idea this morning is this. Jesus Christ invites those who respond with humility and those who can never repay. First point, Jesus invites those who respond with humility. So in the first six verses here in Luke 14, he tells us about a particular situation with a sick man and that Jesus heals. Verse one gives us the setting. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. So we know it's the Sabbath day. We know that Jesus is eating in the home of, of a Pharisee and not just any Pharisee, but a ruler of the Pharisees. And we know exactly how Jesus got there. Look at verse 12. He also said to the man who had invited him. So we know that Jesus was invited to a meal in the home of a ruler of the Pharisees. Now this is the third and final time in the gospel of Luke where Jesus is invited into the home of a Pharisee. There's lots of speculation as to why Pharisees would invite Jesus into their home, but we don't have to speculate in this particular passage because the text tells us. Look at verse one, back up in verse one. The Pharisees were watching him carefully. Now this verb could literally be understood like this. They were lying in wait, ready to pounce. That's the word picture here for this, for this verb. So they were trying to trap Jesus. They were trying to find a way to accuse him. 
Now, if I'm honest here, this is why I get a little confused because to this point in the life and ministry of Jesus, he has already violated the religious leaders' Sabbath traditions on at least seven different occasions. He cast out a demon in Luke 4. He healed a fever of Simon's mother-in-law, also in Luke 4. He allowed his disciples to pluck the grain in Luke 6. He healed a lame man in John 5. He healed a man with a paralyzed hand in Luke 6. He delivered the woman with a disabling spirit. Remember a few weeks ago from Luke 13. And in John 9, he healed a man born blind. All of these on the Sabbath day. So if the Pharisees are looking for evidence, I think they've got it. I don't know why they are continuing to do this. So I ask myself, what's the point? Why the continual repetition of Jesus breaking the Sabbath? Well, one commentator explains it best, I think. He says this, quote, Luke is trying to show that even after all these demonstrations of power and compassion, the religious leaders still do not get the message. Sin is blinding and a hard heart is tough to break. Despite numerous opportunities, the leadership fails to see what God is doing. So I think they're continuing to fail to understand. And so Jesus in his compassion is continuing to teach them. So back to the story. Verse two tells us that a man with dropsy was also at the meal. Now, dropsy, also called edema, is a condition that refers to an abnormal accumulation of liquid in the tissue in the cells of your body. It would result in swelling all over your body. It is an awful and a painful condition. Um, so this man at the meal would have had swollen arms, swollen legs, maybe even a swollen face, a swollen midsection, which means his condition would have been obvious to everyone there. It also means that clearly this man was not invited as a real guest to the meal. He was a prop. He was a trap. He was a pawn in the Pharisees' plan to accuse Jesus. They knew if Jesus does not heal this guy, they'll say, Jesus, you're not compassionate. You're not loving. You're not kind. And if he does heal him, they can say, oh, you broke the Sabbath. But Jesus is wise, right? He's all wise. He's all knowing. He knows what they're up to. Verse three, it says Jesus responds to them. Now, it's funny because they haven't said anything. So what's he responding to? He knows their heart. He knows their intentions. He knows what they are doing. So he responds by asking them a question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now, personally, I think Jesus is asking this before healing the guy because he's like, hey, I've already taught you guys this. I'm Lord of the Sabbath, remember? So is it okay if I heal this guy or not? I think he's asking them, have you learned anything yet? <laughs> but verse four, they remained silent. They do not get it. So Jesus takes the man and heals him and sends him away. Then in verse five, Jesus says, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? His point is clear and it's one that resonated with everybody. Compassion is always right. You wouldn't leave your son or an animal that you have in a well to die on the Sabbath to suffer and die, but you'll leave this man to suffer and die on the Sabbath? No matter what day it is, deeds of mercy are never out of order. We know the Pharisees are convicted because again, look at their reaction, silence. They cannot answer Jesus's question. So what does the story about the man with dropsy have to do with the rest of the passage? Just Hold on, we're gonna come back to this man later in the sermon. But for now, let's move on with the narrative. Verse seven tells us that Jesus tells a parable to those who were invited to the meal. So keep in mind, the setting hasn't changed. They're still at the house of the ruler of the Pharisees. The only difference now is the man with dropsy has left. But Jesus is witnessing something that he sees as wrong. The invited guests are choosing places of honor at the Pharisee's house. Now, according to the Jewish dining customs, the way the house, the dining room was set up is the seats would be in the shape of a U. Think of a big U on the ground, okay? And the seat in, at the base of the U, at the very top of the U was the most honored person. So the most important person, the most respected, most distinguished individual sat in that seat at the base 
of the you. And then the seats next to that individual were the next most important people, right? And then it would filter down around all the way to get to the very bottom down here. These are the least important people, okay? They sit at the very end of the you. <clears throat> so Jesus is watching them fight. That's what this, the implication here is that they are fighting, clamoring for the seats at the base of the you. And in response to this, Jesus tells them a parable. Now let's read it again. Look at verse eight. <clears throat> when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. Then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. So it's not hard to understand, right? Think of the you. So Jesus is watching them fight to sit here. He's saying, don't sit there, sit down here so that the host may say, hey, move up guys. And as you move up, you're being honored as you move up, right? Instead of sitting here and being dishonored and shamed as you move down. Now this idea is actually not new to the gospels. Proverbs 25, six and seven is very similar. It says, do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Yet the Pharisees who know their Bibles don't do this. In fact, we know from other places that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the scribes, this is not how they acted at all. Luke chapter 20, 46 and 47 says, beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces, in the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. So the Pharisees and their friends are doing this now. They are in front of Jesus fighting to be honored and Jesus confronts their attitude. Now, a, a very similar situation to this actually happened to my wife and I when we were overseas. Um, Asian culture, the dining situation is very similar, but instead of a U-shaped, it's a circle. And the seat furthest away from the door is the most honored seat. It's the one that's in the corner and it's the one who's facing the door. As you come around the circle, the least honored seat is the one closest to the door with your back to the door. So. In our first year overseas, we were invited to a dinner with some very important people in our city, um, including the mayor of our city, who was a high ranking government official. There were probably 20 or 25 people invited to the meal. And we got there and it was a massive circular table with 25 seats all around it with a big lazy Susan in the middle. And we happened to be one of the first ones there. So we thought, hey, we'll go sit in the corner because like that's the hardest seat to get to. It's the hardest access, right? Like what if the mayor wants to sit there or has to sit there and he has to go to the bathroom or something. He's got to like climb over all the other people to get out. So we're thinking, hey, we'll go sit in the corner and be ready and waiting for them when they get there. So we're there, we're smiling, we're ready. And in comes the mayor and his entourage, all of his people, and a good friend of ours who happened to be invited to the meal also. And the look on her face <laughs> when she walked in and saw where we were sitting was priceless. She was horrified. And she did exactly what Jesus says she would do. She comes up to us and sweetly but urgently says, you guys gotta move. <laughs> I said, why? And she said, that's the mayor's seat. We were so embarrassed. So we stand up and everybody's watching. So we don't want to make a big deal. So we just moved the next seat over. Because we're thinking we need to get down as fast as possible. Again, she's so embarrassed for us. And she says, guys, that's the vice mayor's seat. And so we get up again. And I had the smarts enough to ask at this point, where should we sit? And she goes, she like raises up all the way around the circle and she says, over there <laughs> at around the circle to there. And I'm like, okay, so we get up. Now, before you think I'm criticizing Asian culture, I'm not. They loved us deeply and we were treated wonderfully, but we had unknowingly sat in the wrong seat, right? Now, 
The ones Jesus is talking about here, talking to in Luke, are not doing this by accident. This is important. They are intentionally choosing the seats of honor. Quote, this scene depicts an itch for honor as the guests make a mad dash for the most honored seats as if it were a game of musical chairs. Jesus then directly confronts their attitude. Now again, we're gonna come back to this in a minute in the so what. But for now, let's, let's keep going. Second point this morning. Jesus invites those who can never repay. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in verse 12, Jesus shifts his audience, okay? Seven through 11, he's talking to the invited guests. Now in verse 12, he begins to talk to the host, the one who did the inviting. He said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So the customs of this day operated on the principle called reciprocity, which means um, you must be repaid for a kindness given or a service rendered. So in this case, you invite someone to a feast, they are expected to invite you to a feast in return, right? This is not a foreign idea to us, okay? When I take a growth group leader out for lunch, if I pay, he often says to me, hey, I'll pay next time. That's, that's normal, right? Or when my daughter gets invited to one of your daughter's birthday parties, we're gonna do the same when it's my daughter's turn for her birthday party. We're gonna invite your daughter, right? It's only fair. So what's the problem here? The problem is motivation. The ruler of the Pharisees is excluding the people whom he knows cannot repay him. You could really translate verse 12 like this. When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not only invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or their rich neighbors. See, Jesus, again, we see his wisdom here. He knows their hearts. They were only inviting people they knew would be obligated to repay. So their, their motivation was greed and pride. But Jesus turns this on his head and says, no, no, no. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot, because they cannot repay you. So this idea of reciprocity was also very common in, in, the, in the country where we lived overseas. One particular instance sticks out in my mind. We made really good friends with the lady in our city that cleaned our streets. She would sweep the streets. She would uh, take out the trash, uh, take it to the dump every day. She would fix things around the city, around the campus where we lived. And she was an incredibly nice and sweet lady. We became friends with her. She loved our family. She loved our kids. She was always ready to help in anything that we needed. She was very poor. And so we, Christine and I would often try to give her a gift just to say thank you and just to show an appreciation of our friendship and she would never accept a gift from us. We would bring things back from America, tea and, uh, and coffee and chocolates and winter socks because it was really cold in our city and nothing. She would adamantly refuse to accept anything from us. And it wasn't until years later when we were about to leave that we finally asked her why. Why would you, why won't you ever take anything from us? Very embarrassedly, she simply said, because I can't pay you back. She said, I have nothing to give you in return. So the host that Jesus is talking to, back in verse 12, he knows that. He knows there are certain people who can never repay him, so you know what? They're not invited. They don't get to come. In his greed and selfishness, he is selectively choosing the people that will benefit him the most. Jesus says, no. You invite the people that can't repay you precisely because they can't repay you. That act is an act of pure generosity. Jesus says that type of thing will be rewarded at the resurrection of the just. Now, the resurrection of the just is referring to 
the judgment and reward of believers spoken about in 1 Corinthians 4, 4 through 5. Paul says, it is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So really, Jesus' point here in 7 through 14 is really the same. We must humble ourselves and let God be the one to exalt us. Which leads me into the so what. I have two questions. <clears throat> First, to the unbeliever in the room or to the unbeliever listening online. Here's my question for you. Is your pride preventing you from surrendering to Christ? Is your pride preventing you from surrendering to Christ? Because we have to ask ourselves, what really is Jesus doing here? Is he just giving us etiquette on dining? Is, is he really just giving us, you know, tips on how not to offend people when you're invited to a meal? Is that, is that really what he's doing? No, obviously not. Remember, Jesus is giving a parable here. Now, what's a parable? A parable is a story put alongside something for the purposes of new understanding. So think about a parable for a second. Think about the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the pearl. Those are given to learn something new about the kingdom of God. Think about the parable of the good Samaritan. That's there to teach us what it means to be a neighbor and who is our neighbor. So the parable of the wedding feast, Luke, Luke 14, 7 through 14. What is it teaching us about? The answer is salvation. That's the answer. About who's invited to the heavenly banquet? Who gets to dine with Jesus at the great marriage supper of the Lamb? That's what it's about. How do I know that? Two places. Verse 14, we just looked at it. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. That's when Jesus returns at the end to judge. The second place I know is from further down in verse 24. Now, our story from today actually continues into the sermon text for next week. But look at what Jesus says here in verse 24. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. My banquet is a reference to the heavenly banquet, the great banquet at the end. So Jesus is not giving us tips on how to dine and not offend people. Here's what he's saying. You cannot earn your salvation. Think about it. In order to try to get to heaven, you could elevate yourself before God and say, hey God, look at, look at what all I've done. Look how great I am. Don't I deserve to be in heaven? That's certainly what the world thinks. How many times have you heard people say after someone dies, oh, I know she's in heaven because she was a good person. Or, or, or he deserves to be in heaven. All the good he did on earth. Or my favorite is when athletes or celebrities, they win an award or something, and then someone has died in their life and they say, so-and-so's smiling down on me. Now, before you think I'm casting doubt on 100% of these situations, I'm not. Certainly, there are some of these situations, some of these folks that have trusted in Christ alone for salvation. And if so, they are certainly in heaven, worshiping the Savior. But... The prevailing attitude of our culture is that good people go to heaven. Think about it. Our world thinks good people go to heaven. Je Jesus confronts that head on in this parable. We are not to exalt ourselves. We are not to lift ourselves up in the sight of God. We are to humble ourselves in the sight of God because here's the comparison to salvation. Here's where the rubber meets the road. If any one of us exalts ourselves before God and tells him how much, how good we are, how much good we've done, how we deserve to be in heaven, you know what he's gonna say? He's gonna say, that's not your seat. Get up. Your seat is over there. And by the way, over there is outer darkness, according to Matthew 8, and weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's where you belong. Because remember, he's the host. 
So instead, what do we do? We have to humble ourselves. We've got to take the lowest seat. What does that look like? Well, it looks like understanding you're a sinner. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It looks like knowing and understanding that your sin leads to death. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. It looks like understanding that you cannot save yourself. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace, grace is unmerited favor, blessings you do not earn or deserve. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Why? You know it, so that no one may boast. Humility looks like Jesus, who was the perfect example of humility when he stepped down from heaven took on flesh and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. That's what it looks like to humble yourself before God. There's no pride in that. There's no desire to exalt yourself in that. You're saying, God, you're my only hope. So do you see Jesus's parable coming to bear now, right? Verse 11, you humble yourself, God will exalt you. You exalt yourself, God will certainly humble you. You, but either way, God has the last word. In fact, now think about the man with dropsy now. Go back to him. It kind of makes more sense now, right? Jesus uses this guy as an object lesson. The Pharisees invite him to the meal as a trap, right? He's a pawn in their plan, but what they don't realize is they're bringing him to the only person that can save him. The man with dropsy comes in humbled and he leaves exalted. The Pharisees come in prideful. What do they get? Silenced. They are humbled in the end. That's the point. You think you're good enough, you're not. You think you can earn your salvation, you can't. God is the exalted and the exalter. Run to him and be saved. Second question is to the believer in the room, which is probably most of us in this room. So to the believer, to the follower of Jesus, here's my question. Is your pride preventing you from growing in Christ? Is your pride preventing you from growing in Christ? <laughs> As I said before, pride is a dangerous thing. It's something that probably all of us struggle with on some level or another. I know I've certainly had to deal with it for the better part of my life. I assume it's, it's always gonna be something that I'm gonna have to daily take up and surrender to Christ. But pride is not just a dangerous thing. For the Christian, it's a senseless, short-sighted, and foolish thing. Now, for the next few minutes, I'm gonna kinda pull at a thread. And we're gonna watch it unravel and I, I want you to pay attention and to kind of track with me over the next few minutes, okay? Everything I am, and I'm talking about me because I happen to be the one up here talking. So everything I am is the result of God's grace in my life poured out through other people. People tell me all the time, Pastor Scott, you're this and you're this and you're this and you're this. Okay, great. Do you think I just woke up like that? Do you think I had anything to do with that? Folks, numerous, and I mean numerous men and women in large and small ways God has used to shape me and make me who I am. It began with my parents who took me to church and taught me the principles in the Bible. My older brother helped me understand it, the parts I didn't understand. I had faithful Sunday school teachers here, like Jerry Webb, who taught us week after week. And then when I hit middle school, I was introduced to a tall, redheaded pastor named Jeff Long. He became my youth pastor, and for the next six years, he discipled me. He taught me so much, I don't have time to go into it. But along with Pastor Jeff, I had faithful youth leaders, men and women like Jim and Brenda Wright, Rick and Dana Martin, Marty and Angela Bradshaw, Kip and Beverly Kelly, Jim and Wanda Willis, Bob and Sharon Kolb, Bob and Linda Woods, Mitch and Debbie Aker, Terry Rathman, Skip and Bobby Midkiff. I'm sure I'm leaving some out, so please forgive me. But we had family friends like 
Kay and Al Turner and their, and their sons, Greg and David. I had baseball coaches like David Morrow and Alan Stewart. All of these people were constantly teaching me and showing me, giving me examples of what it meant to look like Christ. Then I go to college and I was discipled by Mark Valentine, Britt Pettigrew, Clyde Comer. Then I go to seminary. Countless professors and people poured into me, taught me the Bible, helped me understand things I didn't understand, encouraged me in mission. Dr. Jones, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Little, Dr. Aiken, Dr. Reed, Dr. James, Dr. Lederbach, Dr. Lawless, Dr. Lawson. The church I was a part of back then had men who loved me and continued to teach me. Like Dave Owen and Brian Frost and Chip Bugner. Then I go overseas with my family. We had several amazing supervisors who continued to teach us, to shape us, to mold us, to let us fail and then correct us. Unfortunately, I can't say their names for security reasons. But now that I'm back from the mission field, people are continually discipling me. I'm constantly learning from Pastor Jeff. I'm blessed to work with older men who help me in so many ways, who continue to be an example to me, Mike Rice and David Bell Isle among them. And I am so blessed to be in relationship with our elders. Bill Napier, Jim Broom, Joel Abernathy, Steve Nelson, Ken McDaniel, and up until a couple months ago, David Morrow. These are godly men who love me. They talk with me. They spend time with me, and they're not afraid to correct me. Now, I just named 57 people. 57 people who are responsible in large ways for the person I am today. And there's more. There's dozens more in smaller ways whom God has used to shape me. Now, why did I take the time to do that? Three reasons. Number one, to simply say thank you. I don't say it enough. I'm fully aware of how God has used you in my life. Number two, the reason I went, I took the time to go through all these names is to prove in detail that I am a product. I'm made. I'm a result of God's work through you. Your faithfulness, your love, your wisdom, your holiness, your patience, your time made me. Or to put it another way, if you were not faithful to love and to train the next generation of followers of Christ, I would not be here. There's no way I would be standing here doing what I'm doing right now. I would be off somewhere alone, probably apart from Christ. Thirdly, I went through those names because I would be willing to bet that each person in this room also has a list. If I gave you a pen and a piece of paper and asked you to write down the names of people that God has used in your life to make you the person that you are today, your list would be just as long as mine, if not longer. Folks, how can we be prideful people? Think about the foolishness of that. It is the height of foolishness to be prideful over something that you didn't even do. We have the audacity to walk around with our head up in the air and our chest out. Look at me. Look at what I did. Look how good I am. No, you didn't. We are nothing apart from the grace of God. Nothing. Now, here's the cool thing. I didn't make this up. This comes from the Bible. Will you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4? <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 6 and 7. Paul writes, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? What a, what a truth. What do you have that you did not receive? 
Receive implies that you did not earn it. It was given to you. And it's a rhetorical question because the answer is nothing. Everything was given to you. Now, in the near context, Paul is certainly referring to spiritual gifting, but the principle most certainly should and can be applied to everything we have. Listen to how one commentator explains it. Quote, this verse alone severs the root of boasting. Whatever talents you have, whatever intelligence you have, whatever skills, whatever gifts, whatever looks, whatever pedigree, whatever possessions, whatever wit, whatever influence you have, put away all pride because they are free gifts. Brothers and sisters, God opposes the proud. That word means to battle against. He is fighting against the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. I was in in conversation this week with one of the other staff, and he reminded me that the great Martin Lloyd-Jones preached a sermon on this exact passage. So I listened to it, and it was fantastic. And in the sermon, he reminded me of the old hymn, Rock of Ages. I'm going to quote a line from it that perfectly sums up what we're saying. Some of you know it. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked I come to thee for dress, helpless I look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Folks, that's it. Jesus is our only hope, but we got to humble ourselves and come to him empty handed. We bring nothing. We got to come like this. God, I'm nothing. I'm helpless. I'm foul. And if you don't wash me, I'm going to die. I say it again. He is the exalter, not you. He's the only way for salvation and sanctification. Brothers and sisters, we pray with me now as we go to God. Father, we are humbled by the passage as you lay down very hard truth. And as we've said before, Father, pride is difficult. It is a sneaky sin, but oh, it's a dangerous sin. So we need your love your grace and your compassion. Father, I pray for the non-believer in the room to stop trying to earn their salvation, to stop thinking they have to get right before they can go to you. Father, it's precisely when we think we're nothing, when we know we're helpless and apart from you, we will die, that you come and rescue us. Father, for the believer in the room, I pray for conviction to set in. Father, the truth that we are nothing apart from your grace as poured out through others, that everything we have is a gift that has been received. Help us to not be prideful. Help us to put away, to kill pride in our lives. All for your honor and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're able this morning, why don't we stand as we respond in song?